everybody. Good evening. My name is Brooke Steinhauser. I'm program director at the Emily Dickinson Museum, and it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. I love that you're already chiming in to greet us and that you're so excited to be here for our virtual celebration of the 193rd birthday of Emily Dickinson, which we just marked yesterday, December 10th. And in celebration of this, we were joined by uh, about 250 friends at the museum on Saturday for an open house this past weekend. And now we are wrapping up our festivities with this virtual birthday party with all of you. And what could be more festive than a behind the scenes look at the evergreens and a conversation with two friends whose memories of this special place offer us a window into its extraordinary story. Before I introduce tonight's guests, a few reminders for our at-home audience. Um, Zoom-generated closed captioning is available for the program tonight, and you can toggle that on or off using your Zoom toolbar. Uh, and we encourage you to use the chat feature, which, of course, you are already pros at. Um, it's a great place to connect with each other and with us. And um, please do chime in now if you haven't already. Let us know where you're coming from today. Uh, and finally, there will be a period of questions and answers at the end of this program using the typed Q&A feature. So again, that's accessible from your toolbar. Usually you can find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and please be sure to place your questions for our speakers there because we may miss them in the chat. Um, let's see, I wanna just check on where everybody's coming from today. I see you, Virginia and Utah and Mexico and Florida, and we got Tennessee in the house, um, Oregon, Brooklyn, Canada. <laughs> it's always really amazing to us to be connecting with all of you wherever you are. Uh, thank you again so much for, for being here tonight. So um, <clears throat> this evening's program brings us to the Evergreens, which is located just west of the homestead and accessible by a small footpath that runs between the two houses. The Evergreens preserves an integral part of Emily Dickinson's private world, an impressive time capsule of a prosperous 19th century household in a small New England town, the house remains as it was when the poet's brother and his family lived there and is still completely furnished with Dickinson family decor selected and displayed by the family in the 19th century. So the Evergreens and the Homestead together have comprised the Emily Dickinson Museum since 2003. But as some of you know, who may have visited us in the past year or so, the Evergreens has been closed to the public for preservation work since the pandemic, actually, since 2020. And as we look ahead to the spring of 2023, we are delighted to share that the Evergreens will be reopening to our visitors. And tonight we are celebrating that and we're celebrating its long history in supporting the legacy of our favorite poet. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the two raconteurs who will share their stories with us tonight. First, I'm gonna introduce Jane Wald, who is the Jane and Robert Kiter Executive Director of the Emily Dickinson Museum. But her association with our site actually began in 2001. So two years prior to the founding of the museum, uh, when she was hired as the director of the Evergreens. And shortly, you'll hear more about those years prior to the joining of the houses. Um, since becoming director of the Emily Dickinson Museum after its founding, Jane has led all restoration and preservation projects and undoubtedly knows these historic houses and the three acres they sit upon better than anyone alive. <laughs> <laughs> and most recently, she is the author of an essay in the 2022 Oxford Handbook of Emily Dickinson, a short biography of the homestead and the evergreens. Let's add you to the screen there, Jane. Hello and welcome. And, hello, hello. <laughs> and we'll be joined as well by Martha Nell Smith, who is Distinguished Scholar, Teacher, and Professor of English and Founding Director of the Maryland Institute for Technology in the Humanities at the University of Maryland. Her numerous print publications include seven singly and co-authored or co-edited books, including Rowing in Eden, Rereading Emily Dickinson, and she wrote that in 1992, Open Me Carefully, Emily Dickinson's Intimate Letters to Susan Dickinson from 1998, 
still a, a beloved favorite. And Emily Dickinson, A User's Guide, which is a title that is forthcoming in which the user is Susan Dickinson. And so this is to be the first monograph biography of Susan. We're all very excited about this. Martha Nell is also coordinator and executive editor of the Dickinson Electronic Archives projects at the Institute for Advanced Technology in the Humanities at the University of Virginia. And she also serves on the advisory board of Harvard University Press's Emily Dickinson Archive. The feature film Wild Nights with Emily was made based largely on her work. So we are just delighted to have the two of you here and we are um, in for a night of really remarkable stories. Thank you, Jane and Martha Nell. Hi folks, I just wanna say hi. Hi, hi, thank you, Brooke. Um, and good evening, everyone. Um, I, Martha Nell and I have uh, decided that we are outfitted in green in honor of the evergreens. Um, and I, Martha Nell, I think that your color is much closer to the wallpaper here than mine. So <laughs> you've done- you've Kind done of looks well. like it, I mean, I, <laughs> which I, I didn't mean, realize. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm sitting here in the parlor at the Evergreens, and as you can see, it's still a little buttoned up um, since the uh, conclu the very recent conclusion of our, our project to improve the environment and environmental conditions here at the Evergreens for our collections. And um, well, the people in the <clears throat> who come in the house also get the benefit of that. Um, so the the evergreens hasn't quite been put all back together, but it's slowly emerging from its cocoon, and you can see a few of the few of the objects behind us. Um, this evening, I think that um, maybe one of the first things I want to say is uh, happy birthday to Emily Dickinson, one ninety three, and um, and to Susan, whose birthday comes uh, just eight days later. So Susan's birthday, um, also her 193rd, is Tuesday of next yeah. week. Right, so the 19th. So we have uh, more celebrations to, to come. Um, so what we're gonna do this evening is, I think I'm just going to um, give just a thumbnail history of the Evergreens as a, as a building uh, and the family that lived in it, the people who lived in it, um, and I'll go through that pretty quickly. And then we'll turn to the, the wonderful women of the Evergreens, um, uh, Susan, Martha, and Mary Hampson. And uh, we'll, we'll um, explain more about them uh, as we go through. So just, just for now, just for this little thumbnail history, I'll tell you that the Evergreens was built uh, for Austin and Susan uh, by Austin's father, Edward Dickinson. Uh, at the time of their marriage in 1856. And so this is kind of this eye-catching um, Italianate design that was new to Amherst, but in the kind of frugal New England style, it was, um, it was actually attached to the front of um, a quite, quite a small vernacular tenement uh, that Edward Dickinson owned and rented uh, to uh, the town's working class residents. So the, the Evergreens as a kind of fashion forward house became a center of the town's social and cultural life. Um, and it just, you know, everything about it reflected the wide ranging artistic, literary and intellectual interests of the entire family. About 25 or 30 years after its original construction, the Evergreens went through kind of a gradual Re redecoration to bring it up to uh, up to date, up into the style of the 1880s and 1890s. So Austin and Susan Dickinson lived here until their deaths. Austin in 1895 and Susan in 1913. Then their daughter, Martha Dickinson, Bianchi, uh, as was her married name, um, she continued to live here in the house until her own death in 19. 43, and she made it kind of a memorial to her parents' generation uh, and to her Aunt Emily's poetry. However, she was concerned about the future of the house and um, gave kind of conflicting signals about whether she wanted it saved, whether she wanted just the content saved, uh, or whether really she just wanted the house raised to the ground. Um, 
which is a phrase she used in her will. Well, ultimately, she left the house and its contents to her literary assistant and co-editor, Alfred Lee Hampson, um, who later married their mutual friend, Mary Landis. So just as Martha had done, uh, the Hampsons uh, wanted to figure out ways to ensure the preservation of the Evergreens and its contents as a cultural resource. And um, Mary uh, was uh, more effective than Alfred in, in figuring out how that could happen. So uh, this was accomplished after Alfred's death in 19. 52, Mary remained the owner and the guardian of the Evergreens uh, for another 36 years until her own death in 1988. And at that time, she established a private testamentary trust that was charged with developing the house as a cultural facility and keeping the contents intact. So as Brooke uh, said earlier, the, the house is still completely furnished with Dickinson family decor um, that the families themselves, the, the Dickinson family members acquired uh, and used and displayed in the 19th century. So that's our little, our little history uh, lesson. And with that, uh, that brief introduction to uh, Susan, Martha, and Mary, um, let's go a little deeper. And so I think what I'd like to what I'd like to do to start is to share with you um, some excerpts of Susan Dickinson's obituary. So, and I presume that this was mostly probably prepared by Martha. Um, and you may, you may, you may share what, whether you think so, <laughs> Martha Nell, or maybe you know whether it was, but um, it certainly sounds kind of like, yeah. Um, Okay, so this is um, an excerpt from uh, Susan's obituary in 1913 in the Springfield Republican newspaper. And this is a, kind of an interesting subhead for this uh, obituary um, uh, about an old and honored resident of Amherst who was also widely honored abroad. How about that? Um, so part, part of it reads, uh, she was a woman of rare quality and truly a distinguished citizen of the town who had made her home for many years one of the notable features of the community. She had undoubtedly entertained at her board more men and women of distinction in the world of literature and affairs than any other householder in the place. She possessed a charming and gracious personality and unusual gifts as a conversationist. She had always a keen interest in the arts and particularly literature and was a wide and sympathetic reader of the best works, both modern and classic. She shared with her husband a fine discriminating taste in art and their home has long been notable for its beautiful pictures. Mrs. Dickinson was an enthusiastic traveler and enjoyed greatly the life in Europe where she was much admired and shown in the Cosmopolitan Society of Rome, Nice, Paris, and other famous old world cities. Um, let's see, she went abroad four times after she was 70 and for years has followed European politics with keen interest and intelligence. And intelligence. She was a real lover of humanity and always a most appreciative and observant student of nature. Uh, then it goes on to uh, talk about the beautiful flowers and shrubs at her home, and then um, that she made it a place of delight and refreshment to all the visitors who are honored by admission within its portals. The list embraced such men as Ralph Waldo Emerson, George William Curtis, Wendell Phillips, Henry Ward Beecher, Dr. Josiah Holland, Governor Alexander Bullock, Colonel T.W. Higginson and the late Samuel Bowles, and such women as Helen Hunt Jackson, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and Mrs. Frances Hodgson Burnett, the novelist. So this obituary talks, it also talks about uh, Susan's husband and children, it's not, but nowhere in this does it mention Emily Dickinson. Um, so uh, fast forward just a year, and um, the following year in 1914, Martha Dickinson Bianchi published her first uh, her first collection of uh, Dickinson's poetry. 
And this is what, this is the, the very beginning of her preface. Um, all right. The romantic friendship of my Aunt Emily Dickinson and her sister Sue extended from girlhood until death. The first poem dated was sent in 1848 and probably the last word Aunt Emily ever wrote was her reply to a message from my mother. Quote, my answer is an unmitigated yes, Sue, unquote. During the last year of my mother's life, she read and reread these poems and innumerable letters with increasing indecision as to the final disposition of her treasury. It eventually devolved upon me to choose between burning them or giving them to the lovers of my aunt's peculiar genius. My hesitation was finally influenced by a note written in their early twenties, which I quote, Dear Sue, I like your praise because I know it knows. If I could make you and Austin proud someday, a long way off, twould give me taller feet, Emily. And then finally, this is my inspiration for a volume offered as memorial to the love of these dear dead women. Um, that is, you know, both of those, both of those bits of writing are, are extraordinary. Um, and um, Martha, now, you know, you know, Susan and Martha. Um, Susan and Martha, they're, they're good friends of mine. They're good friends. <laughs> so um, comment, please. Well, uh, the letter that Martha is quoting there is uh, an exchange that is at the end of an exchange that Susan and Emily are having about safe in their alabaster chambers. And uh, Emily is writing several different second stanzas to maybe suit Sue to get her commentary. Um, and you can tell that she's getting a little testy at one point when Susan says, that, you know, the second stanza is not quite, it just doesn't give me quite the chill, the current one version of it that the others do, or one of the others do. And Emily writes her and says, is this a little frostier? <laughs> you know, so, and then it's in response to that where Emily, you know. Um, so that's one comment I'll say. And if people want to see that exchange or what survives of it, they can either, go to open me carefully it's in this or which has also been republished by the way in 2018 by wesleyan press or they can go to emilydickinson.org and they can look at um emily dickinson writing a poem and i believe the museum will put up a link for y'all to see of emily dickinson writing a poem there it is. Um, so what strikes me about some of that, you know, the, the posthumous writing about Susan is um, what someone wanted her to be known for, right? And, but there are other people who have written about what Susan was like. And uh, I right. you know, wonder if you, you might, uh, share something of her, you know, her personality. Yeah, people who knew her. Yeah. Um, well, um, John Erskine, who was an American educator, biographer, poet, pianist, composer, critic, an English professor at Amherst College, uh, recounted that Susan was cultured, intelligent, and kind. And those three words or versions of them have come up time and again in everything I've seen by people who actually knew her, who were welcomed into the evergreens and whom she chose to entertain. So I thought it, it might be useful to pass along some of Erskine's story of getting to know Susan and Martha. Um, he described them as two women he immensely in, who in he immensely enjoyed their hospitality, admired them greatly, 
and uh, said that he was first encouraged by some to regard them, you know, to hold them in low regard. And, um, but then he gets an invitation to the house to come for lunch. And um, he actually got to know them. He said before he got there, he gathered that Susan Dickinson had a mind much above the ordinary. Those who know her agreed that in her prime, she was a proper mate for Austin, his equal or surpassing him in culture and his superior in social grace. By all odds, she was, they said, the most brilliant talker in that part of the state. Martha, or Maddie, he described as tall, self-willed, perhaps sometimes a little erratic, with more than her mother's talent for extraordinary conversation. Uh, when he's invited to the house, I thought that people might get a kick out of this. He gets a note, which he learned later is to come to lunch. And then he makes the comment, no Dickinson ever wrote so that more than two words out of three could be deciphered. <laughs> but yeah. finally, you know, I mean, anybody, you know, the handwriting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And especially if anyone thinks Emily's handwriting is difficult, a crack at Susan's. Um, but he solved the puzzle. I had been invited to lunch with Mrs. Austin Dickinson and her daughter. I went, of course, and for the rest of my years at Amherst, I prized the Dickinson hospitality with correct premonition that I should meet nothing quite like it again. And he talked about it was as much uh, as anything, a hospitality to ideas, and that Martha and her mother could be found any evening in the library, reading before the open fire, ready for visitors who brought something for the mind. He described the long library table as covered with current magazines of the most formidable kind, journals of philosophy and history, quarterly reviews. It was crowded with books, and so was every other room on the ground floor. The large parlor on the left, the various offices, which disclosed themselves to you as you penetrated deeper into the house. There were many paintings, but the books impressed you most, and they were a true library for use rather than show. I once expressed, he says, my amazement at the difficult reading I found on her library table, and Susan graciously responded, it's a conviction of mine that one should keep something near them, something tough to get their teeth into. And she did that till the end of her life. So, yeah, so the Evergreens was very much an intellectual center. And of the town, Susan hosted many salon, literary salons, um, she facilitated a lot of reading of her peers and, you know, she hosted musical events and things like that. And of course, things for the college on behalf of her husband, her father-in-law and the Dickinson family. Yeah. And it was also, I mean, it, um, in connection with these salons or gatherings, um, this was also a place where Emily Dickinson's poetry was heard. That's right. Susan read Dickinson's poetry aloud. And I thought maybe it might be useful to read, I don't know, a few selections from Open Me Carefully. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's have some. <laughs> okay, let's have some. That's right. I'll start with One Sister Have I in the House. And you this know, is that one is, uh, that's the one. Martha starts with in the single hound. That's right. That's right. And that's the one that somebody wanted to get rid of and curiously didn't burn it or throw it in the trash, but inked over. Ah. And, you know, um, 
but didn't realize that Susan had her own copy of that poem. Right. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's a poem probably a lot of people, people know who are sitting here with us. And I'll read it. One sister have I in our house and one a hedge away. There's only one recorded, but both belong to me. One came down the road that I came and wore my last year's gown. The other, as a bird her nest, builded our hearts among. She did not sing as we did. It was a different tune. Herself to her a music as bumblebee of June. Today is far from childhood, but up and down the miles, I held her hand the title, the tightest, which short up and down the hills, sorry. I held her hand the tighter, which shortened all the miles. And still her hum, the years among, deceives the butterfly. Still in her eye, the violets lie moldered this many may. I the morn, I chose this single star from out the wide night's numbers soon forevermore. She doesn't write anything like that to anybody else. And my friend, the poet Joseph Donahue, uh, we had a long conversation about this and other things that Emily sent to Susan. And he wrote, in this letter poem, the beloved, that would be Susan, is explicitly linked to the order of the cosmos. She is a star chosen from amid, chosen amid many from out the wide night's numbers by the beginning poet. The, the poem calls the universe to be around the name of the beloved. Sue, forevermore. I don't know about you, but that's pretty astonishing. Yeah, that is. That's uh, the equation there is pretty astonishing. Yeah. Um, uh, I wonder if you have maybe one more bit from Open Me Carefully to share. And then I, I also have a question for you about Sue's writings. Okay. So. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to share two more. This one's much shorter okay. from Open Me Carefully. But I could not drink it, Sue, till you had tasted first. Though cooler than the water was the thoughtfulness of thirst. Emily. And then I'll point out it is to Susan that um, Emily writes, or about Susan, to be Susan is imagination. You can find all of those writings in Open Me Carefully. And I'll just read one more that, uh, and it's just part of it, the end of it, um, is she ends a poem that begins, I was just, or a letter poem, that begins, I was just writing these very words to you. Susan fronts on the Gulf Stream when Vinny entered with the sea. And then she ends that with, dare I touch the coincidence? Do you remember what whispered to Horatio? Emily. And do we remember what was whispered to Horatio in Act Five of Hamlet? I think you should tell us what was whispered to Horatio. Well, I will. How is that? You know, I mean, they often talked in Shakespeare with sen sending each other little notes back and forth. And in Hamlet's dying words, he says to Horatio, What a wounded name! Things standing thus unknown shall live behind me. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, 
absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain, Horatio, to tell my story. In this harsh world, draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. What a request, what a demand on the one hand, and what a witness on the other to loving trust. Yeah, absolutely. And so Susan, you know, in her way did tell Emily's story and certainly Martha did. Um, and um, Susan, not as the first editor of Dickinson's poems, but in her own way, she carried on her, her legacy. And in the house, you know, in this house as well. That's right. I mean, she wasn't the first editor in that she didn't get a volume out because Lavinia thought she was moving too slowly. But she actually placed a poem mm -hmm. in uh, the late, you know, late in 1886, the year that Dickinson died in a journal and she continued to do that. I think it was in the century, I'd have to look at my own timeline. Yes. So she was very active and she didn't stop um, working on Dickinson's poetry. And I think, and I think we've talked about this, Jane, that she certainly, and Martha as much as says it, she certainly worked on the editing of The Single Hound. Yeah, Martha did as much as say it, that her, you know, her mother was, continued to go over and over these manuscripts uh, and that it devolved to, to Martha, who, I mean, Martha, she's fascinating uh, yes. person also in her, uh, her career, um, you know, after, you know, after her schooling, um, she was an excellent pianist. Um, Yes. And she, yeah, attended the, um, attended the Smith College Conservatory for several years, and then studied in New York City with um, a woman named Agnes Morgan, whom Martha really praises to the skies. And I haven't been able to find out much about Agnes Mor Agnes Morgan yet. Um, but there also, she met the director of the Moscow Conservatory of Music, who was doing a stint with the New York Philharmonic. And it was this man, uh, this Russian mus musician that helped her select the baby grand Steinway in the Evergreens parlor, which is, I can reach out and touch it right now, but I won't. Um, Please do. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, Martha is a poet. She began writing poetry in the... 1890s had quite a number of poems published in places like um, Harper's or The Atlantic. Um, and, I, you know, I've seen these um, these little notebooks that she kept. I think there are maybe six of them where she pasted uh, the published versions of her own poetry uh, and filled, filled every page. And there is something like six of them. Um, so these are individual poems that are published. But then she also... Um, during her lifetime, uh, uh, published at, at least three collections uh, of poetry. And one of them, you know, four collections, I think. And there's one that always strikes me called the cathedral because of the way it's constructed. It she takes, I mean, and this is, must be after her European travels where, you know, she just loves these cathedrals and bought uh, photographs, these large scale photographs that she lined the staircase here at the at the Evergreens uh, lined it with these photographs of cathedrals, but the the poems are set themselves are each one is titled after a, a, a some feature in a cathedral. So very interesting. And then as a novelist, you know, she had these six novels, um, right? That are very interesting to read. Uh, but of course, she's best known for her work. Um, her kind of biographical and editing work with her aunt's, uh, uh, about her aunt's life and her poetry and her letters. Um, so, so she, you know, she's kind of a remarkable person and I would just love to know more about her. Um, what, um, 
Martha Dell, what do you think we should know about Martha? Um, again, sort of, I, I, I gave sort of the framework of some of her, you know, her sort of writing life, but what do you think we should know about Martha? Well, it seems to me in everything I've read about her, and the, these are by people who actually knew her, were entertained that like Erskine, she was a brilliant conversationalist. She was an astonishing musician. She appreciated, like her mother, she was very cultured. She loved to travel. And uh, am I correct that the Venus and Adonis behind you, or the Venus and Psyche, sorry, um, the Canova mm -hmm. replica, that that is something that Martha brought, or was that there from the, but she loved it and she wanted to go to, she loved Italy. Right, yes. Oh yes, Italy, I think was her favorite place. Um, right. Seemed to, you know, pick up all kinds of, um, well, Italian art and um, objects. I, you know, was looking at her, uh, she created an inventory of the evergreens um, in 19, 22 and I was just I was looking at it yesterday to find something that you had mentioned um so I think a chair and yes. I was struck as I was scanning through it how many things she says oh I got this in Florence oh I got that in Venice um you know right quite a yeah and you know she also had this tremendous friendship uh, with Mary Landis, who is sort of the, the one who kind of secured the evergreens for the future. And you have had <clears throat> a number of opportunities to, <laughs> you had a number of opportunities to meet Mary, I think. And um, I, you tell, tell us a little bit about how you got to know her, uh, your your first visit? Uh, well, um, back in 1984, so a long time ago, almost 40 years ago, I made my first visit to the special collections of Amherst College Library because I had started asking questions about what are all these erasures about in the letters to Austin? Good grief seven lines erased, you know, half of a page cut out. What is going on here? And I was already pretty sure they always had something to do with Susan. Anyway, I'm, you know, a little graduate student and I'm studying the manuscripts very, very carefully. And you know how you can be sitting somewhere and you, you're like at a table and you feel like somebody's staring at you? Well, I looked across the table and this woman was staring at me and it turned out, she, and my calendar says it was Ruth Jones, whom I think was a guide at the homestead at right. the time, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And a his, sort of local historian too. Yeah. And so she said, Judging by what you're looking at, because she'd been watching me, she said, I bet you're interested in Susan Dickinson. And I said, yeah, I am, as a matter of fact. And she said, well, you should go talk to Mary Hampson. And I was like, Hampson, Hampson, Hampson. I know that name somewhere. And then it occurred to me, it was in the copyright pages mm -hmm. of Harvard edition. And I said, well, where does she live? She said, she said, in the evergreens. And I said, well, I don't know her. I can't just walk up to the house and ring the doorbell. And she said, call her up. I said, well, I don't have her number. And she said, it it is. <laughs> she said, it's in the phone book. So I called her up and I said, <clears throat> Mrs. Hampson, my name is Martha Nell Smith. And I am very interested in Susan Dickinson. And um, I would like to come over and visit you tomorrow, if that's okay. 
And she says, why do you want to come visit me? And I said, well, you know, I just told you, I want to see what you know or hear what you know and all of that. And she said, what have you read? And I said, uh, well, I've read a lot of Martha Dickinson Bianchi's work. What? She said. I said, first I cited the single hound poems, letters and life and letters face to face. She said, that's all well and good, but you need to read Martha's poetry and her novels. I said, yes, ma'am, I'll do that, promise. And then she said that she'd taken a fall that day and wanted to know if I knew what it was like to be x-rayed. And I said, of course I do. And, and I told her how I hated it because, you know, the x-ray tables, they're cold, they're steel, blah, blah, blah. Then I said, since she just told me she had fallen, that I must have caught her at a bad time. And she said, oh, the worst. You could not have caught me at a worse time. But for some reason, she continued to talk with me. And we talked for over an hour that night. And I will tell you, all the questions she asked me, they were harder than anything on my doctoral exams, you know, to qualify, to write my dissertation. And, but she said, you come over tomorrow. And I said, okay. And so I went, this was March 22nd, 1984. And I was to call at 10 but I'm from Texas and I phoned about 10, 10 and she answered and she told me to come over when I wanted. Then someone rang the doorbell and was bringing her peanut butter. And when she came back, then I realized as she closed the door that she'd forgotten that she was on the phone and I could hear her going, kitty, where's my kitty here, kitty, kitty. And I was like, boy, I better get my little tush over there right now before she forgets. So I went right away and she scolded me for being late. And she said, people don't consider others time. I apologized profusely and then gently told her, Mrs. Hampson, I think your phone's off the hook. And that mollified her and she laughed and you saw a picture at the beginning the way she could throw her head back and laugh and we began talking i'm reading by the way the audience should know from my journal entry at the time so this is contempt this is a yeah. record yeah mm -hmm. she took me to a window in front of the side porch sat me down with a box of sister sue's book she always called sue sister sue and we gabbed as I been to, began to go through and sort them. I found one of Lavinia's. I found several of Susan's. I found a couple of Austin's. And we got distracted in, her, in our talk. And I ended up not quite finishing sorting. But I had a marvelous time and got quite an earful. And then I, in a later note to her where I'm asking permission to come over in May, she said, definitely, you come over. And uh, she probably asked me again, why would you want to do that? But I said in the note to her, I said, I remember from that first visit that we laughed and laughed. And we did. She was quite a storyteller. Then should I read part of the entry where I'm talking about what the house looked like? Yeah, I think we want to get a sense of the house too. So yeah. Okay. So I said, how can I describe the house? Emily Dickinson's house has been done over since she lived there and the lavish, lavish Victorian decor is all gone. You guys have corrected that. But anyway, this was in 1984. It's only reminder is an Italian marble fireplace and a crystal cranberry glass sherry set. However, the evergreens is as it was 100 years ago. Original wallpaper and drapes are still there. 
Most of the drapes hang from wooden hoops that slide on a finished branch that has brass bands about three to four inches in from the ends. Then I draw it in my journal. Uh, the wooden curtain rods are not machine made, but hand finished and are beautifully contoured to enhance the shape. The fireplace is, I believe, marble. And on the mantle is the statue of lovers that you can see behind Jane there, reclining in one another's arms. Um, and heavy damask drapes are on the beautiful rods and all seems not to have been dusted in a hundred years. <laughs> Even her rose colored robe was dusty. The only things cleaned were the paintings on the wall. And all she's, it's, there was one that she told me I would, should be particularly interested in and I was. And it's John Kenseth's Sunset with Cows. And uh, it had been purchased by Sister Sue. It's a river scene, but it is the sunset really that catches one's eye. All the clouds are pink, gold, orange, and indigo. The brilliant colors of a beautiful setting in the West. The sky takes up about two thirds of the canvas and the bottom part is, a, is the river scene and 10 or so cows being driven along by a herder. Mrs. Hampson told me how dusty the painting was. <laughs> it was all black, but I spent a summer cleaning it. Imagine my delight when I first uncovered the tinge of pink, then one of gold. Another painting, I believe she said, was purchased by Sue, was of a reclining woman looking very somber and pensive up at the mass of massive cross. And really it's the top end that shows so much and that has two little babes crawling around the top. Um, and then she showed me a needlepoint that Susan had done that was in a stand that I mm -hmm. think is still there. I've seen it many times since then. Yeah, yeah, like a fire screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I keep describing in my journal entry how dusty everything was, and that my hands, when I pulled them back after I was sorting those books, were all black with dust. And there were all over the massive decor, including all over the floor, are piles and piles of books, papers, and old newspapers. They were piled everywhere. They were on that piano, on the tables, on chairs, everywhere. She told me that the house looks as it did when Sue died, when Susan died. And, you know, I wrote in my journal, of course, it is faded and others people's junk and the dust of a century. And I wrote a little note to myself. How many times have I mentioned that? That it was dusty, right? That it, it was dusty. Yeah. They, piled on top I, of think, it. I think but, decades of coal, coal furnace has. Yeah. Had, yeah. That's why know, my hands are I mean, flat. You can, you can see some of that kind of soot still still in place yeah I mean not like an artifact you know but <laughs> right yeah. and you know she said um or I said to myself as I was finishing my journal entry and I have it underlined perhaps this is the most fascinating experience I've ever had yeah 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 it was pretty incredible. Yeah. And at the end of that visit, she told me that, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be around for my November 15th birthday. And I said, you'll be around. I bet you'll be around. And she replied, don't you ever bet on anything. You can't count on, you can't be absolutely certain of anything. So don't bet on it. Fascinating person. I, you know, Boy, Very. she's got an uh, kind of an iron will. Uh, yeah, and, and she's 
Uh, go ahead. She was very learned. This this kind of quiz she gave, what have you read? Um, that's a little uh, it's a little more forceful of a screening than, you know, Martha used to welcome pilgrims into the Evergreens. Right. You know, back in the 20s and 30s and 40s. And I think she may have given them just a teeny tiny bit of a quiz before she brought them into the Emily room, the room she set up with all of her aunts, you know, manuscripts and, you know, personal items. That's an, that's kind of an interesting parallel between them <laughs> that I hadn't really thought of before. It really is. It's quite fascinating. Yeah. And um, no, go ahead. I mean, it's just, she really did get, it was hard. Mm -hmm. And I somehow realized I better be talking about Martha because I knew somehow that she really liked Martha. Yeah. I don't know she, how I knew that. Yeah. Um, now she did, she named this testamentary trust for, it, I, I believe the phrase in her will goes like this, um, setting up this testamentary trust uh, in the name of that great American author. And you know what everybody's expecting, right? When, right. That's the lead in, but that great American author, Martha Dickinson Bianchi. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I, I wonder if um, maybe we could take a look at a little bit of what the Evergreens looked like, what it may have been like when you first saw it. So yeah. we, have some, we have some photos here. Uh, and after that, I'd like to tell you a little story about my second visit. Yes, I want to see that. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, we can just go through these together. Um, this is the Evergreens in the 1930s. You can see that it had awnings on the windows. Um, yeah. It certainly was, I mean, you know, I see this picture, there are these trees all over the place, but somehow it still got enough, it got more light than we can ever pull into this house today. And I, I think that's, uh, I wish we could. Uh, <laughs> um, Susan, yep. uh, 1856. And these are kind of unusual photos. This is Martha Dickinson Bianchi in her wedding dress. She married um, a Russian cavalry officer in 1903 uh, on a European trip. Uh, and then a little bit, you know, some decades later there on the right. And yes. Mary. That's the laugh I was talking about the way she throws back her head. Hmm. Hi, Mary. So that's probably Mary in the probably 1970s, I think. And here is Alfred. Um, so Alfred would spend, you know, long ter terms of time at the Evergreens helping uh, Martha with her editorial pro projects. And traveled with her also, traveled to Europe numerous times with Martin. And then we get to the 1970s. And um, so we, we can't necessarily talk very long about how um, Barton Levy St. Armand and George Montero convinced, well, came to understand that the Evergreens had, uh, was sort of a trove of Dickinson history and um, made a visit to Mary Hampson. Uh, I think their first visit was in 1976. And somehow Bart managed to take uh, a number of photographs of the house at that time. And I just wonder what kind of grilling uh, Mary put them through. Uh, yes. Yeah. But for years, they'd come back, say, every maybe once every three or four weeks. Uh, and she came to have a great deal of confidence in them. Uh, mm -hmm. And that relationship eventually 
uh, turn to Mary feeling comfortable that the remaining uh, books and manuscripts uh, at the at the Evergreen should be housed at Brown University, which was where um, they were um, they were both on the faculty there. Um, and you know you can see some of the books here a little lower on the shelf that uh, you know that came across in what John Erskine had had written about their house. That's right. And, and some of those on the shelf below are by Martha. They're copies of her books. Uh, down there on the right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think her publisher was always bound in red. Duffield, I think it was, but they always bound her books in red. Yeah, I think that's right. And the uh, the dining room, two different views of it. Um, you can tell these are old prints because they're kind of darkened and faded a bit. Mm -hmm. um, on the left, here's the library. And all that stuff, that, is that what you, that's oh, what you yeah. That's, and you can see how things are stacked everywhere. You know, on the left, under the sofa, in front of the sofa, on the right, under the table, on the table. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And same in the um, the photo on the right is the Emily room and kind of same, same thing going on there. Look at all that stuff under the table. They, they were everywhere. <laughs> and tell us about this. Well, isn't that, that's up in the tower. Mm -hmm. And my guess is a lot of those are uh, Century magazines. I can't see for sure, but she had a lot of copies of the Century. And I remember the first visit, I looked down, she was sitting in a chair and I looked down at her feet and on one side of her, she had a current people magazine. <laughs> and on the other side, she had a, the century from like the 1990s or 1890s. And you would likely find her reading contemporary magazines or novels as well as, or poetry, as well as something from the late 19th century. Something I always found very interesting about her. And, yeah. So then this is um, almost 20, not quite 20 years later when um, the Martha Dickinson Bianchi Trust was formed. And this is sort of the first entry into the Evergreens um, after Mary Hampson's death and, and the creation of the Martha Dickinson Bianchi Trust. So um, we have a few photos here and we can, we'll see if anything has changed. <laughs> There's a, you know, still a, a parlor full of books yeah. Well, it was a library. Yeah. The whole yeah. house. Yeah. And it was a library when Susan and was living there with Martha and, and before that. Another view of that space. Some of the paintings you can see. The library in the library. Right. And the dining room. Sat with Mary a lot in that room. Yeah. Yes, uh, which reminds me we need to come back to that story. <laughs> and then the kitchen where you can see, you know, the, the cast iron range from the first decade of the 20th century next to, oh, probably a 1950s one. And I remember the first time I went into that kitchen to the right of the electric range was a microwave. So there were these like three, three iterations of cooking equipment right there lined up to next to each other. Right. <laughs> oh, one of my favorite places, the loft with just look at all that stuff. Um, some of the, like you can see 
these 19th century wicker chairs. Um, there's that, um, that leather seat chair there on the left with uh, it's kind of um, Elizabethan revival. That, yeah. That's stored there from the homestead. Mm. Just all kinds of trunks and baskets and furniture and all kinds of stuff. Didn't you tell me there were Christmas decorations up there? Yeah, I think the first time I went in to this to the loft the, to into this very space, there were like paper, there are Christmas cards and sort of paper Christmas decorations just kind of spilled out on the floor. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, going through uh, going through box the boxes of uh, objects later on, um, Christmas seemed to be a big deal to Mary. Uh, yeah, lots of stuff related to that holiday. Aha! And here's the Kensit. Here's the Kensit. Yeah, that's the one she talked about cleaning, and you can see why she was so delighted. Yeah, yeah. And she uncovered those co colors. I worry a little bit about Mary having cleaned it, but that would have done it. <laughs> but, you know, it looks pretty good. It's pretty good, yeah. And then, is that the one that... Uh, that's the other, okay. that's the other painting I was talking about. And she said that that was one of Susan's favorites, too. That's interesting. This is the um, the vision. Is this is a copy of that? I think uh, one, perhaps Susan, a friend of Susan's, painted this copy for huh? um, a, a, of the vision of Saint Helena, who was Constantine's mother and apparently responsible for his conversion to Christianity. But certain uh, Sue had quite a connection with that painting. Yeah, she did. And there we have them again. This is uh, on the left, Susan. I believe this portrait was made in Berlin when she was around 75. Okay. And then in the middle, Martha, um, probably in her 60s. And Mary. That's a really interesting photo of Mary. It is. She looks like she's doesn't want to have her picture taken or something. Yeah. Well, that's um, one reason we wanted to show um, to share these photos with with all of you is uh, it just well, partly to to honor that part of the Evergreens history. Uh, and the efforts of Susan and Martha and Mary to um, to preserve it, to keep it intact um, as a kind of home for Emily Dickinson's work. Um, it, but also, um, um, also just because we're, we're the Evergreens is going to be open again in um, the spring of 2024. So we're looking forward to welcoming all of you back. Um, so these photos from the past now get to move forward to, um, to next spring. But we also, so moving forward, speaking of moving forward, Martha Nell, um, yes. what, I mean, what, what also is kind of the future of scholarship on Susan and Martha, um, uh, your well, own, or what you think needs to be done? Yeah, well, I obviously think, and and because I've been writing shorter biographies of Susan, uh, the first one I published in a, a Cambridge Companion was in 2000, and then I published another in 2002, um, and there's a biography of her online at the Dickinson Electronic Archives, and People should check out Writings by Susan Dickinson. And the editors and I, um, I have our wonderful project manager and an assistant who also works on that. They are busy helping me decipher Susan's 
handwriting, and you'll see that she's an extraordinary poet. We have some of her, she published some of her stories in the Springfield Daily Republican. She was very interested in women such as Harriet Prescott Spofford. Um, and I think people need to know that. And I'm trying to welcome people into her very literate world. And so, uh, you know, she deserves cer certainly more than I will publish in this coming year. And I'm going to, you know, there's a whole world for, of Susan that's beyond the Dickinsons that I think is important to know. Um, and because she was very interested in people. And as I have told you, the words that keep coming up with people who met her is that she was not only intelligent and not only cultured, but very kind and considerate. And, you know, she nursed wounded soldiers during the Civil War. She nursed Emily when in De Emily's later years, when Emily was dying. And I think that that needs to be known about Susan, besides the fact that she was a writer. So, Martha, now what um, Susan as a writer is, I mean, that that's kind of interesting. She's, she wrote all different kinds of essays. I mean, she even one, wrote one on um, so Elizabeth Blackwell, like the first yeah. Yeah. position. First, yeah, that's up on the, in writings by Susan Dickinson. We have that up on the archives. And then she said something in a letter um, about sort of like what poetry meant to, meant to her. Do you? Oh, yes. Did I forget to say that a while ago? She said, Poetry is my sermon, my solace, my hope, my life. She wrote that to Curtis Hidden Page, who was also a writer and editor. And think about that. Poetry is my sermon, my solace, my hope, my life. No wonder Dickinson loved her as an audience for reading and for getting feedback. Yeah. What do you know about when, do you know the year of that letter? That's, or... very, that's very late. She's, that's in the early 1900s. It's right at the turn of the century. So, because her handwriting is when Susan is older. Um, yeah, poetry is my sermon, my hope, my solace, my life. Somebody put in. Um, and um She's sharing with him what poetry means to her. And when you think about it, that means that poetry was everywhere. She was reading Emily's poems and other poems to people in the parlor, you know, whoever came to visit. And that, I think, is really important to know. And she loved the poetry. And she read more than Emily. She's got a review of Spofford that's up on the Dickinson Electronic Archives and her account of Elizabeth Blackwell, where she talks about the hostility. I assume people know who Elizabeth Blackwell is or was, was the first woman doctor in the United States. And she talks about the hostility to Spofford by other women because she was learned. And that's just heartbreaking to read. That's not the only thing she says in the essay, but she attended her graduation and it's mm -hmm. an account of Blackwell's graduation. Well, that's, um, yeah, there's um, so much more, I think, to know about these women. Oh, there's a lot. And, yeah, and um, what they've, you know, what they lived out in the Evergreens and, um, and what they lived out in their lives that are just such, so fascinating, so multifaceted. Um, but I think maybe we will turn it back to Brooke and see if there are some questions. Before we do, may I tell one little story about Mary? Yes, oh, that one, yes. <laughs> Second time I went to see Mary, I called her to say, I'm done at the library, can I come over? She said, yeah, she said, would you would you do me a little favor? I said, okay. So she says, 
go to Russell's Liquor. It's right up the street from the Homestead and Evergreens. And get, and I wrote very carefully down what kind of sherry she wanted. And so I go into Russell's and I'm a graduate student. I don't have a lot of money. And I put the sherry up on by the register and I start counting out my money. And the man behind the register said, there's no charge for this. This is for Mary, right? And I said, yeah, it is. And he said, there's no charge. So I grab the bottle and I start to walk out and he said, excuse me don't you want to take her some Pepperidge Farm goldfish? And I said, huh? And he said, trust me, she'll love you for it. She likes to eat Pepperidge Farm goldfish with her sherry. With her sherry, yeah. And she did. And so she and I said at the dining room table that um, you showed Jane sipping sherry and eating Pepperidge Farm goldfish. And once, I'll just say this very quickly, when I took my uh, partner spouse, she looked at her and said, are you, didn't we see one another? Weren't we together at the Berlin World's Fair? And ML, Mary Lee, starts kicking me under the table and is like, what do I do? She's talking about a world fair in the 30s, I think. And then Mary threw back her head and laughed and said, oh, of course, we weren't together at the world's fair. Anyway, she was a delightful woman. So I think um, I yeah. think Sherry and Pepperidge Farm goldfish are in our futures. <laughs> uh, the appetizer for everyone. So, Brooke, what do we have to... Um, uh questions from folks I'm, I'm definitely going to go home and have some sherry and goldfish um we have some really great questions coming in from the audience and uh, if you haven't had a chance yet to put yours in just go and find that q a uh, bubble at the bottom of your zoom toolbar uh, let's start with this one um carol was curious about your uh, the nature of the books martha nell that you were handling when you first came to visit mary hampson the books that had belonged to susan and austin um what what were they what were you looking for well i i I'm, i apologize that i didn't write down the titles but i can remember that there were some 19th century novels. Obviously, there's if it's Susan's, it's not going to be, well, it might be early 20th, and several kinds of poetry. There was also a history book. So I can remember, I just don't remember the titles. And there was a math book, and that was Susan's. I remember that. And something that's important for the audience to know is that Samuel Bowles sends these two very difficult philosophy books. That was another one of the books with Susan's name in it to Austin. And he says, these came in to the Republican and I send them to you to deliver to Susan because no one, the very hard reading and no one in the Connecticut Valley, but Susan could possibly understand them wow. and you know that was borne out by the but there were as i said philosophy math science a lot of science books and a lot of poetry and novels those books that you were handling with mary are among those that ended up at brown university brown. Where yeah can, yeah where that has you know i think more than two thousand books from the from the combined homestead and evergreens. I mean, I have a list that um, came out when they were emptying yeah. out the homestead and it is long. Yeah, yeah. Family of readers. And while we're on the subject of books, um, uh, where can we find Martha Dickens and Bianchi's poetry and fiction? Are these books still in print? Can we find them? It someone recently republished the single hound. By recently, I mean within the last decade. Uh, but you can sometimes get books, you know, at bookstores that specialize in rare books. Um, Face to Face, I think, was also republished 
Am I, I think a, ch a chapter of it, I think the first chapter or the first section of Face to Face was published just last year, I believe, again. But I think you do kind of have to rely on, um, you know, internet searches for those books, but they're yeah. around. And are, I there are, how many novels did she have? I, it's like six, seven? I think it was six. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and they also might be on um, like internet archives. Yeah. I mean, and they're all over there in my bookshelves, but I'm not selling my copies. <laughs> Jane, I know you've read maybe all of her novels. You've read all of her novels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what, how, what would you, how, how would you describe Martha's authorial uh, voice in her novels? Well, I, first, I think the thing that strikes me first about her novels is her style of writing is is very much of its own time. Yes. Um, it's it's not like anything you'd read today, and it's not like anything you would have read earlier in the 19th century. Um, so that's what strikes me most. Um, it, usually she has some kind of... Um, or often she has some kind of uh, kind of point counterpoint between a sort of wholesome New England and um, Europe in decline, you know, something something like that. And there are some, I mean, there are obviously some autobiographical uh, autobio. Let me try that word again. Autobiographical. Um, elements to the story, like you can kind of see. I mean, in one of her novels, she there's a sort of a almost a villainous um, matron who, in the novel, is named Vera. Her mother-in-law's name was Vera, so um, it just makes you wonder. <laughs> wow. Uh, let's see, we've got um, another sort of question about um, uh, Mary Hampson. So um, what do you believe compelled Mary Hampson's fierce commitment to the preservation of the evergreens? Was it a belief in Emily Dickinson's work or more about a devotion to Martha? Um, I will um, I'm sure oh. we both have opinions, but you go first, Martha. Yes, I um, I would take the or out of that question, but I do think she was very committed to Martha and promoting her writing more than she was committed to promoting Emily Dickinson's writing because Dickinson was already before the curtain, as it were. So was Martha. And actually, Martha's novels were much more popular than people realize. Isn't that right, Jane? Yeah, I think so. One of them, I believe one of them, I think it was the Cuckoo's Nest, got yep. optioned, I think, yep. for, you know, either for production as a play or or film. Um, there's, a, there's a huge correspondence in her papers about the Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> Any and film so I, out I, there listening should... Uh should read that title. We want to see we want to see it optioned again. <laughs> um, is there more more along the lines of that question of Ma uh, Mary Hampson's motivation? Well, I mean, I think that um, she was very committed to Martha. Um, if you look at her, there is a, a volume called Guest in Eden of uh, people who I don't know how y'all can if y'all can see that well um, but it's remembrances about Martha and uh, they're they're really quite wonderful and the last one in there is by Lewis Ginsburg also known as Allen Ginsburg's father um, and um, so I, I will say, I do think she was very committed to Martha and that she, you know, we might say she was in love with Martha. I'll, I'll say that. Um, but she, um, and she thought Martha had been misjudged 
I mean, she told me, yeah, you've read all of that, Martha, but you need to read all of the novels. And that's why I have them. And I read them quite a while ago. I keep thinking, oh, I need to refresh myself. And Jane's read them. Maybe we're the only contemporaries who've read them. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But but I, yeah, I agree that Mary, uh, she wanted what Martha wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and Martha wanted the Dickinson family to have Emily's poetic legacy. Um, yes. So... Therefore, Martha was dedicated to that. Yes, Mary. I mean, okay. therefore, Mary was dedicated to that. Yeah. So while all of this um, preservation uh, and, and publishing work was going on out of the Evergreens, um, Patrice would love to know just what was happening across the yard over at the homestead. So maybe a, a brief coinciding history there. <clears throat> Yeah, um, so let's see. The homestead stayed in the Dickinson family until 1916. At that time, Martha sold the homestead to um, the Park family. Um, Hervey Park had just become the rector of the Episcopal Church in town. Um, and the Park family uh, uh, retained ownership of the homestead until 1965. Five. And at that point, that's when Amherst College purchased the house and used it as a faculty residence um, with the stipulation that there would be, you know, access to Emily Dickinson's room as a, you know, as a, a nascent museum. Um, so all of that, so, you know, it was just that one family, then um, Amherst College personnel, uh, and then the um, it, it there ceased to be any residential function in the homestead in roughly 2000, 2001, something like that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think maybe if we've got time for one more question, are you uh, amenable, Jane and Martha now? We this are. Is a, this is a good, a good one from Freya, which I think kind of... Um, brings in all of the, the women in this story that you've been sharing. So uh, do you think, given the many women writing, the feminist causes with Seneca Falls, Lucy Stone, Higginson's abolition, and women's rights work, how would you respond to Emily Dickinson being a type of feminist? Uh, or Sue, we hear so often to not apply terms to the past, um, but women like Rebecca Harding Davis, Elizabeth Stewart Phelps, and so many others were writing about women's rights who they both also read uh, along with Spofford, et cetera. So this is a question about, you know, in this in this incredible legacy of active women and bright and brilliant women, um, where where do our modern ideas of feminism kind of fall? Well, I mean, one of Susan's reviews, that you can find in Writings by Susan Dickinson, which I think the museum put a link to it, um, uh, is a review of Spofford. And it's, you know, very favorable. And Jane and I were talking before about, it's kind of a feminist view of Elizabeth Blackwell that you get in Susan's writing about Elizabeth Blackwell. And, I would say too, the choices that Emily Dickinson made, um, she was living her life on her own terms, you know, which was quite brave and powerful, even though she, yes, she had the privilege to do that, the financial privilege. But a lot of women who had that didn't necessarily make those choices. I don't know what do, what do you think, Jane? Um, I for both Emily and Susan, I think I would, say, and I suppose Martha also. Um, mm, yeah. Um, I I think the phrase "living their life on their own terms" is is a very good one. Um, 
I think it's um, the, there's clarity around that with 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 Emily, I think, because I mean, in Susan's case, Susan was certainly and Martha, they were both more involved in, you know, the the world of, you know, mm -hmm. society, social life, political life. Um, so there, I think there's sort of this evolution among the the three of them. Um, I don't, I, uh, I, I, I think, I, I'll, I'll say this for myself. I, I feel that we, uh, I, <laughs> don't yet know enough about Susan and Martha. You know, their biographies are, um, are still emerging mm -hmm. to, you know, be able to really pin down a specific answer to that. But um, I, I like what you said about that, Martha. Yeah, well, I, well, and I will say that, you know, it's kind of obvious I like reading people's mail. That's how I got started on Emily Dickinson or dove deep more deeply into Dickinson. And I've been reading a lot of Susan's mail. And at the same time that she will sometimes make a crack about that you we might consider it would make me uncomfortable about suffragists. On the other hand, she'll turn right around and be very sympathetic to them writing to the same person. So um, I don't think women's rights were really anathema to her. But I also think that culture circumscribed her. And I th and when you think about it, Martha really did live life on her own terms to a large, you know. Yeah. She, yeah. Um, yeah. I love I love these answers, and I think uh, we're all just waiting with bated breath for uh, this forthcoming monograph from you, Martha Nell, um, where we can all learn a little bit more and keep asking these really, really good questions about this incredible legacy. Um, thank well, you. I, oh, yeah, I purposely made this first volume a little bit shorter so that because there'll be much more to add, and it'll also be linked to the uh, writings by Susan that are, is online. And I speak for all of the editors of that. And I think I said this before that we welcome suggestions for anything you think might be our misreadings in deciphering or handwriting. <laughs> not an easy feat, I know. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Martha Nell Smith and Jane Wald, for sharing these remarkable stories with us tonight uh, through your own work and dedication the, to Emily Dickinson and to this place. You are following in the footsteps of these women that we've heard about tonight, of Susan, Martha, and Mary. And if not for them and for you, uh, these evocative words of Dickinson's might have been the fate of the evergreens. So here's a little poem from Dickinson. I found it pretty haunting. After a hundred years, nobody knows the place. Agony that enacted there, motionless as peace. Weeds triumphant ranged, strangers strolled and spelled at the lone orthography of the elder dead. Winds of summer fields recollect the way, instinct picking up the key dropped by memory. So mm. we are um, we are left with so much more than uh, just the key dropped by memory because of of the work that you all have have been doing. Um, uh, a recording of this program, like so many of our others, will be available in our past program archive, and we will put a link to that in the chat now for everybody. We want to also extend our thanks to all of you who have joined us tonight from around the globe to yes. celebrate the 193rd birthday of our favorite poet. Dickinson's birthday also marks the end of another season at the museum. So uh, we have had a year full of explorations of the poet's life and work, full of meaning making around her legacy for our present day, and full of the continued growth of our global Dickinson community. And we are looking forward to more of that with you in 2024. 
In the meantime, if you haven't already, please consider making a donation to the museum, a little birthday gift uh, in support of our free programs like this one. Uh, you can visit us at emilydickinsonmuseum.org to do that. And there you can also join our mailing list and learn more about what's coming up here in the place that Dickinson calls home. We're wishing uh, each of you a safe and peaceful holiday season and a fresh start to the new year. Martha Nell, what- Yeah, what I just have one more thing to say. First of all, I wanna thank Jane and you and the museum staff. And I wanna thank everybody who came tonight. And also don't forget to celebrate or please remember to celebrate Susan Dickinson on December 19th. It's her birthday. Yeah. Absolutely. But continue the Dickinson birthday celebration. <laughs> Not to be forgotten. Thank That's you right. so much. Thank you, Martha Nell. Thank you, Jane. Good Thank night, you, everybody. Brooke. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Take care.